For ranchers that own their land, would you say you're in the cow business or the land business? Because if you answered cow business, you might be limiting your financial potential of your resources. Farmers and ranchers always underplay what they have. Nick DeCastro, founder and CEO of Land Trust, is my guest today as he shares with me how they are pioneering an avenue that helps landowners monetize the recreational assets of their land in practically a turnkey method. With Land Trust, you pick your prices, you pick your activities, you pick how much you want to, you know, what days are available. You can block out days for yourself, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your business partners, and then you can monetize the other stuff. However, I do have a few questions, things like liability issues, quality control of the guests, payment, and how much say will I have in this process? Landowners always remain 100% in control. Now, if this sounds interesting, where and how do I even start? Well, tune in today to find out on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Welcome you here to another edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm your host, Justin Mills. We're glad to have you joining us on our program today. If you're listening here on the radio dial, we appreciate you tuning in. Uh, but I do understand if you have to step out and go do something and you're going to miss part of the show, you might want to go back and listen to that. Well, a good way to do that is go to our podcast site at workingranchradio.com and you can find it there. You can download it there. You can also find our podcast on pretty much any podcast provider out there as well. But but if you like what you hear or you go back and you listen to any shows, let us know. Leave comments, uh, uh, click all the stars or, or whatever star thing you think <laughs> that the show is, is valued at or worth. But let us know because that's also helpful for us moving forward. On today's show, Nick DeCastro, founder and CEO of Land Trust out of Bozeman, Montana, is my guest. Now, Land Trust, we're not talking uh, conservation easements here. And he'll do a great job of explaining just all what they do. But in a nutshell, uh, working with ranchers to monetize your rec- recreational assets. Now, this might be something that uh, might be new ground for you. Maybe it's been something you've tossed around in your head a little bit, but how do you get started or where do you start? Then we have concerns like, well, what about liability issues and making sure we don't have some knucklehead that comes out there and either makes a mess on your land or and or causes an accident? Well, just a lot of concerns we have and uh, a lot of questions and also, you know, say it is something you want to move forward with. Well, where do you even start? How do you market it? Just a lot of questions with this uh, in regards to this whole concept of utilizing your land's recreational assets out there. And so join us today, Nick DeCastro, founder and CEO of Land Trust, will be joining us to talk all about that. Quick thank you to our sponsors of this segment here today, the American Simmental Association. And they really have provided some and went been pioneers and they really have been key in some fundamental changes to our industry, helping ranchers move their operations forward. Things like pedigree knowledge with actual performance records and now some very advanced genomics, things that we've talked about here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. They're providing more predictability to you, the rancher, so that you can really make some good decisions. Sim Genetics is profit through science. Find out more at Simmental.org. Other sponsors today of the Working Ranch Radio Show, all flip. Cattle identification and record keeping should be easy. So why don't you tie your visual tag and your EID tag and those genetic data information all to one management number with AllFlex match sets. You can find out more at AllFlexUSA.com. Well, the Captain Tim O'Byrne usually steps in at this part of the show for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents, but I visited with him early. He says, you know, I really don't have a whole lot to say, and we better write this down in the calendar because I don't know if I've ever seen a day where the captain didn't have something to say. But nevertheless, I know uh, the the latest issue, the April-May issue of Working Ranch Magazine is out, and I know he worked tremendously hard and all the uh, staff to put that latest issue out, another great edition. Look, uh, Take a look for yourself. We pointed at a couple uh, stories last week, and I would encourage you to get through that and take a look. There's always some very relevant stories in every issue of Working Ranch Magazine, and if you don't have your subscription to it, you 
you can get it started by going to workingranchmag.com. Well, stay with us. Coming up after the break, we're going to get into our featured topic today. Nick DeCastro, founder and CEO of Land Trust, is joining us as we're going to be talking about how they are working with ranchers to monetize their recreational assets on their place. A lot of questions, a lot of concerns. Hope to answer all those questions. And also, stay with us towards the end of the program. Meteorologist Don Day steps in as we take a look at our long-term weather. We'll be back on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. You know, big cows come with big feed bills, which is why smart genetic selection can pay off in your cow herd. Did you know Simmental-influenced cows are an average 74 pounds lighter at maturity than Angus-sired counterparts, according to a recent U.S. Meat Animal Research Center study? Now, while Simmental is sized for more efficient gains, 20-year genetic trend lines also show the breed offers reliable calving ease, early growth, and cow longevity. That's a balanced herd built for profit. Sim Genetics, giving you more per head, period. Stand strong. Simmental. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As we head now into our featured interview today on a subject that, to be honest with you, I really find very intriguing because I feel as landowners, ranchers, many of us fall into that category that we sometimes don't really take advantage of the full resources that our land has available for us. Now, we're very good at the ranching aspect or farming or whatever agricultural element you have in there, and it consumes a large portion portion of our time. Nothing wrong with that. But there's other resources out there and you might have those things in the back of your mind. But then again, you know, how do you start? Where do you get started in this? How do you market it? And just a lot of different questions uh, arise within that. Well, today we're going to be talking with a company that is pioneering this and bridging that gap between landowners and, and also those recreational type users that are willing to pay for some of these type assets that we have available on our land. Land. And so joining me today to talk a little bit more about it is Nick DeCastro, and he is founder and CEO of Land Trust out of Bozeman, Montana. And Nick, thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Really appreciate you having me on, Justin. Well, Nick, the company, uh, the name Land Trust, um, there's, of course, LandTrust.com is the website. We'll refer to that on different occasions, but maybe from a very uh, surface standpoint, and we'll continue to dig a little deeper as we go through our show here today for explanation. But just from a very topical standpoint, what is it? Yeah, great question. So uh, Land Trust, it's a name that can conjure up ideas of conservation easements or things like that. We are, we are not that. We are a for-profit private company. You know, when I founded the company, I simply took two of the most important words. One, land. We are a private lands company. We're staunchly pro-private pro property rights and trust, you know, good old-fashioned trust. So we know that this marketplace doesn't exist unless we have a lot of trust with our landowners and then the guests that they host. So, you know, that's how the name came about. Again, you'd be forgiven if you thought, oh, conservation easement. But, yeah. Well, uh, definitely I, don't do anything with yeah. that. Yeah, and I will tell you, when yeah. I first heard of the name, Nick, I got to be honest with you, I said, oh, this is a conservation yeah. uh, conservation easement type company, and that is not what this is. So a good explanation to get no, us started there. No, that's not what we do. <laughs> yeah, so usually we'll start there. Uh, so what, what do we do? We, we consider ourselves part of uh, what's called the sharing economy today. You know, there's platforms like Airbnb and VRBO or Verbo, however they're calling themselves today, uh, Truro for cars. But basically, hey, you own an asset and you don't use it all the time. And so you can list it on a marketplace and generate income from it. So land trust is a land sharing marketplace. So, you know, we work uh, predominantly with owner operator production agricultural landowners, not, you know, 100 percent. But most of our landowners are those those folks. They have this incredible asset that sits underneath their feet every day that uh, there's a lot of people out there who are you know, passionate people, whether it be hunters, fishermen, bird watchers, RV folks, people who are looking for outdoor recreation experiences, who would be happy to pay them for the opportunity to have some exclusive access to that land for a day, a week, a month, whatever it might be. And so this is a, a market that we're kind of, I would say, pioneering. Um, and it's a, a very profitable new revenue stream to add to an operation. And as you, you kind of led in uh, at the beginning of the segment, we, we try to, uh, you know, evangelize to our production and agriculture landowners that, 
you know, of course, commodity production is the primary kind of goal and, uh, you know, income stream, but there are these other income streams that you stack on that can add nice profitability to an operation. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this, so we're going to get folks, I know as, as Nick has explain this from a very top standpoint looking down we're going to dive into this deeper so stay with us because we've got a lot here to cover on this because i know as a rancher myself and as you're thinking about this you might say well it's not for me well hold on just a bit here because let's 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 go through all of this first nick i want you to explain from the from the non-land owner standpoint and you you sure. kind of got into it a little bit, kind of the sharing aspect of this in our economy and some of the uh, so the businesses that are thriving out there based upon that. So let's let's start with them first, and and how does that work for them? So for the guest side, sure, we have a website landtrust.com um, that can be accessed obviously via your your computer or your your mobile device. But essentially, they can go to landtrust.com and they can start searching through. We have about a million, a little over a million acres on the platform today across thirty some states. But they can go, you know, I started the company. I'm the founder of the company. I started it because I wanted to use the product. So I found myself wanting to, you know, um, have access to some private ground that uh, I didn't have access to before. And I was happy to pay that, you know, that landowner for the opportunity to, get to do that. And so primarily we've worked in the hunting space so far. Um, we've definitely facilitated fishing, foraging, shed hunting. You know, we're going to grow the activities. Uh, there's been some camping and whatnot. But hunting has been the primary focus for us, you know, over the past couple of years. But, you know, from a, from a guest perspective, they go to Lantris.com, they can search by a state, Montana, they can search by an activity, elk hunting or bird hunting, um, or they can search by an actual property name. So Axe Hill Ranch here in, uh, in Bozeman. So they can go and search. They see search results. If you search for Montana, you see all the different uh, properties and, and uh, landowners that we have in Montana. So for some of the landowners out there, known and it kind of helps give them an idea of who's actually participating in this and then you can look at these properties basically listing pages so it, this will feel very familiar to folks who've ever used the platform like an airbnb a vrbo etc mm -hmm. there's a bunch of photos there's descriptions you know nearest towns um, and then the activities that they offer so they could offer hunting they could offer fishing they could offer farm and ranch experiences you can click into those activities and there's different packages hey here's a, a five-day do-it-yourself archery whitetail hunt and it has lodging or no lodging. And you start to get into the, the nitty gritty of what the actual package entails. And then the pricing and dates and calendaring, you pay with a credit card. We do ID verification of all of our, our guests. So we know who they are. They pay with credit cards. There's a lot more trust built in there. And so it feels very familiar to those guests, uh, like, like they would feel with an Airbnb, a VRBO, et cetera. You were talking about the examples you were given was Montana, but I know you said you have a little over a million acres. It's not, I mean, it's mm -hmm. not limited to the West. I know you've got, you've got some plain no, states. I mean, no. it's pretty much anywhere. And we're going to get into from the rancher side as well, that it is available, but it's, it's, I know you started in Bozeman, but it's bigger than that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're headquartered here in Montana, but we're in 30 something states now. Um, we're growing last year. We really focused on Montana, Nebraska and Kansas. Um, so that's a, a, a big chunk of that million acres is in those states. But right now we're in the process of launching Oklahoma, Missouri, Indiana, Iowa, Illinois, North Dakota, and Idaho, oh, wow. uh, in Missouri. So a bunch of different states. Yeah. We're, we're growing kind of, uh, south and east uh, as we speak. So from a user standpoint, what are some of the landowner assets that you see are being sought after by these recreational and hunting type users? Yeah, so everything is about outdoor recreation. So everything's centered there. And, and you know, what's interesting is regionally, these things will, will differ a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk Montana. That's where we're founded. And obviously we've been here the longest. Hunting, uh, you know, across hunting, of course, you have everything from big game to small game, bird hunting, et cetera. But then fishing, for sure, is, is something that's very interesting. Obviously, a lot of folks who hunt fish, so you get that nice crossover uh, right there. We've facilitated foraging. So, uh, you know, there's places that we have along the Gallatin here where I have friends who booked and, you know, collected eight pounds of morel mushrooms in two hours uh, along the river with okay. a kid here. So, um, and then there's, you know, we're going to get more into kind of the RV world where, you know, if someone wants to, you know, book a property to, you know, park an RV for a few days and have it all to themselves rather than, you know, sitting in a KOA with 200 other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity, but I, I think what we always stress to our landlords, like I said, they have this incredible resource. 
that so many different types of passionate outdoor recreators place a high premium on, which is, you know, beautiful property and land to do the, their activities that they, that they love. As we move, uh, it, it's interesting, as we move into like North Dakota and Minnesota, mm-hmm. snowmobiling is like a big one, oh. which we haven't really seen before. So I think regionally you'll see these activities kind of differ. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, hunting, like I said, has kind of been the core activity that we focused on because you have to focus as a small company like we are. But we are, you know, we are expanding those activities uh, as we speak. Mm-hmm. Is there something, in, and it's, uh, I realize, like you said, that it is some of these components that are ha- that are available are fairly regional. Is there something that just kind of blew your mind a little bit as far as this? Like, was there anything as you've been doing yeah. this and going across? Uh, turkey hunting. Oh, really? So turkeys, yeah, so turkeys, look, Montana, Wyoming, the Western states, obviously, if you have access to elk populations, you're very aware that that's a very valuable resource to have access to. But what surprised us is in every state, we did more turkey hunts last year than anything else. Hmm. And turkey hunters are extremely uh, passionate. (laughs) They, you know, and they love to travel. We have some, we have a handful of folks who booked five turkey hunts in different states and they'll just do these big, you know, circuits. They're always going for the grand slam. And, you know, it's funny on the, on the ranch side of things, ranchers are always shocked. They yeah. say, turkeys, like, you know, who cares? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> yeah. they always know that, like, if you have big deer, you have big elk or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, that's, that's a known thing. But turkeys, we call them the gateway drug. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's something that is, it's never outfitted. It's, ne- you know, it's, it's yeah. just kind of an afterthought. But there's, a, there's a, a really big market growing around turkeys. Wow. Yeah, that was surprising, too. And I know that really a lot of states in the country, when you talk about this being able to be across the country, a lot of different states do have turkeys. And I know uh, just Absolutely. several years ago doing a doing a turkey auction for uh, Turkey Federation, those folks that are avid turkey hunters do like to get out into different parts of the country and harvest a turkey from the different regions because of the uniqueness to each of those different types of birds in those areas so yeah so uh you know should take uh, consider consider listing turkey hunting access uh, <laughs> because there are a ton of people who are looking and we're partners with national Wild and turkey federation too so every turkey hunt that's booked on land trust we had a ten dollar charge that we passed through directly to those guys to oh, keep okay. doing the great work that we're doing Okay. Yeah. Well, Nick DeCastro is my guest here today. He is the founder and CEO of Land Trust out of Bozeman, Montana. We are talking about Land Trust. And if you joined us at the very beginning, you know uh, a little bit of definition about that as it's uh, uh, an opportunity for ranchers to utilize the land resource that they have for recreational opportunities. Now, if you are a landowner, and I'm sure most folks listening, uh, you are, or you have some management over land, you probably have, uh, from the rancher's perspective, a lot of questions for Nick as well. And when we come back, we're going to continue on and we're going to get on it from the landowner side, from a rancher's perspective. And some of the questions that you might have, they're ones that I have as well. We're going to continue with that when we come back here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Set up the next generation for a productive lifetime with Zinpro Avela 4. Achieve productive success in your cows with 20% increased conception rate and a 16-day tighter calving interval. Calves from cows supplemented with Zinpro hit the ground running with improved immunity and 28 more pounds at weaning. Allow your cows and calves to perform to their full potential with Zinpro Avela 4. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. Our topic today is our guest is with us, Nick DeCastro. He's founder and CEO of Land Trust out of Bozeman, Montana. And I do encourage you, if you're wondering what that is, uh, first of all, we're not talking when we say land trust. This isn't conservation easements. This is basically uh, a, a situation that's providing an opportunity for ranchers to take advantage of some recreational income that could be uh, potentially there for them. And if you missed that first segment, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. Of course, you can also hit their website at landtrust.com and a great explanation there. Nick, I want to go now. We're going to get into the landowner side of things uh, because I know as guys were listening to this, I'm sure there's just a lot of different thoughts and, and, and probably you're pretty used to dealing with folks that are 
um, maybe a little skeptical of whether or not this is something they want to do as, as I, as I'm guessing a bit here. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through some of these questions that I have for you. And I think, you know, just to start off, it was funny. I was mentioning this to somebody the other day that I was going to be doing an interview with you all and kind of explained a little bit. I didn't have full details, but a little bit of what it was. And, and they like, well, how do you know you don't get uh, some jerk on your place? And so, you know, I I think the question is, is how, how do you vet some of these folks when it comes to this situation? Yeah, it's a great question. And this is, this was kind of the hardest part to solve. You know, as an entrepreneur, we, we look at a problem, we say, how can we reverse engineer it and make it better? And that's how you bring a product or a service to market that hopefully is successful, right? So a few years ago when I was starting this business, look, especially, you know, I started around hunting specifically, although I knew we would do a lot of other outdoor activities, but there has been strained relationships, uh, to say the least, between the hunting community and the landing yes. the landowner, especially farm and ranch community historically, and that was a you know big hurdle to first solve. So you know before land trust or without us, basically you get someone knock on your door. They could be the nicest person in the world. They could be not, and you as a landowner, one you really have no way to know. You don't know who they are. Um, if they do if they do something wrong, you have no recourse. So that's where a lot of the rub has come over the years, that and the fact that maybe there's 30 people knocking on your door every day, uh, which kind of gets in the way of work. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So how how does land trust solve that? So we do a few things. Um, We'll talk about liability because I'm sure that's its own question by itself. So we we, we do handle a lot of that. So I'll I'll talk about that. But with the guests that that use land trust, so one, we do ID verification of everyone. So before they could ever reach out to you or make an inquiry or booking, they're uploading their driver's license or passport. So we know who they are. So there's transparency. Two, they're paying for their bookings with credit cards. So whatever it is about human psychology, when you have their ID and their credit card, there's a lot more accountability there Mm -hmm. than just someone who strolls up to your door and knocks on your door. In our terms of service, they're holding you harmless. You know, and and again, I'll touch on the liability stuff probably by itself. So we know who they are. They're paying with credit cards. We have that, that information. That's also tied to their land trust profile. So now... You know, as a, as a as a guest goes and makes bookings with landowners, the landowner after every booking, both parties rate each other. So just like some of these other yeah. platforms, you know, your guests may have used like a VRBO or 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 an Airbnb or whatever. You have other landowners who are saying, "Hey, they were great." You could read reviews on these people. You're tying it to true identity, which has never been available before in this world. We're talking about like outdoor rack on private lands. So now we're tying actual experiences from other landowners hosting these people to a true identity, you know, their actual real identity. So now if I make a, uh, an inquiry with your, with your ranch, you'll see that Nick has gone on 27 land trust trips and he's five stars. You can read all the ratings on mm-hmm. Or he's a three-star guest. He's been on one trip and there's probably not many landowners who are going to invite a three-star you know, guest onto their property. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's how we handle that. And, and I think the important thing to call out here is landowners always remain 100% mm-hmm. in control. So this is very different than let's say like traditional hunting leases where you're basically selling a property right for a period of time or government programs or outfitters, that kind of stuff. With land trust, you pick your prices, you pick your activities, you pick how much you want to, you know, what days are available. You can block out days for yourself, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your business partners, and then you can monetize the other stuff. And so that's a very different aspect there. And I say this because no one can just book your property on on land trust. It's not like a hotel where it's like, oh, there's an available you know, slot and I'll just book it. Everything is a request. And so that request is me reaching out to you and saying, Hey, I I saw you spring turkey hunts. You know, this is, uh, I have a few questions for you. A lot of our landowners will set up a call and just chat with them real quick, feel them out. They can decline any booking request or accept them based on whatever, you know, for whatever reason. So you stay a hundred percent control. It's basically like virtual door knocking of sorts yeah. where we're saving you a bunch of time and, but you always are in control. No one can just book your place. And I think that's an important part. I, as you were going through that and then I realized, you know, it is a request. It's not a guarantee. It's yeah. just a request. So that's, that's right. Yep. To which the landowner can say no for any reason. Okay. All right. So let's go to the next thing. And you touched on it a little bit because I know that's, I mean, I'm probably just going right down the list of things that you, you guys have have gotten before. So let's talk liability because I mean, uh, we, we've got, you know, these are million dollar uh, facilities or ranches and, and, and the last thing we want is for something to happen. And then we've got to sell the ranch because somebody had an accident. So how, how is liability issues handled? Yeah, so liability was from the get-go. This was the number one question. 
So we handle it from a, a variety of directions. So first of all, any guests on land trust, when they create their accounts, they accept our terms of service, which holds all our landowners harmless. They acknowledge that they're doing potentially dangerous activities on private property, et cetera. So there's that. And so they indemnify you. Two, I think let's start at the state level. So in 34, might be 35 now, ag producing states. So the states that we're really active in, um, the states really want to facilitate agritourism. I mean, really what we're talking about here is agritourism, mm -hmm. whether yeah, it's hunting yeah. or fishing or bird watching or foraging, if it's happening on production agriculture land, it's agritourism. Mm -hmm. So they really want to facilitate this because they want to bring new income streams to those farms or ranches because they want them to be profitable. Now, they know liability is one of the biggest hurdles. And so 34, maybe 35 states now have all introduced agritourism liability limitation laws. And there's some flavor of the same thing. You know, each state will have like little different nuances, but basically they're saying unless there's, you know, wanton negligence or gross negligence on behalf of the landowner, like let's say you have a 300-year-old bridge on your property and it's rickety and you say, yeah, you can go walk across that. So barring anything like that, the state is actually limiting your liability for any sort of agritourism activities, which this is all considered. Then we move into property protection. We self-insure that. So uh, if a guest comes out and breaks a gate or, you know, shoots a cow, they, it's never happened, but it's always brought up. But if someone shoots a cow, yep, yep. Um, one, they're liable. But if for whatever reason they're not owning up to that, land trust will write you a check. I think it's up to $10,000 per instance. Um, then there is the um, injury, uh, personal injury for the guest. So they're out in your place, stepping a gopher hole, break their leg. Again, technically they're liable. But if for whatever reason, they can come to us and we insure them up to $10,000 in medical bills for that. And then there's a million dollar general liability policy. So that is a backstop policy for policies that the landowners may have in place. Uh, we're partners in member benefits with the Farm Bureau. So the Farm Bureau in many states offer an agritainment rider, which is like, I don't know, $100, $200, $300 a yeah. year for, specifically for this. So that's a that's kind of the first dollar in insurance, in insurance terms. So we're partners with those guys. And so, you know, this is a pretty holistic approach. And what I often say to landowners is having people come out through land trust is much safer than, I mean, you probably had folks out on your place. You're less covered in that scenario than mm -hmm. you would be through land trust. You know, right now, if anyone's coming out and it's your place and it's not through a platform like ours, you're exposed more than you would be through inviting guests through a platform like ours. Okay. Well, it's interesting. And just in hearing the different facets of that, you've got a lot of different things covered. In fact, you answered a few more elements that I didn't, hadn't really thought of through that. So let's get into this and in, in the fact of, okay, we've got a guest that's booked if we, we've accepted that offer. Sure. And so is this, yeah. is this like a traditional type hunt uh, or, or probably some of that has to do with the terms I'm, I'm guessing with all of that, but what are you seeing? I mean, how do, what's the range or the gamut that you will see in the terms of, am I having to go and guide these yeah. hunters or do they do it on their own or how does that all work? Yeah, it's a good question. So we built land trust for production agriculture landers, busy people. We have landers who've never met any of their guests. So oh. part of it goes into this, so I'll give you a little bit of background. This is all built for the do-it-yourself. It's not built for, this is a guided, you know, do all okay. that kind of stuff. Okay. Now we have landers who are, you know, they, may, they might be outfitters in their states and they, they're happy to do that. They want to do it. Um, but this is do it yourself. It's basically a trespass fee. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's the base level. It's people who are just you're saying, you can go out on my property to do that activity for this many days or, you know, this period of time. And it's cost this much money. So, you know, part of this is when we onboard a landowner in the states that we're active in, we send somebody out there. We call them landowner success managers. They're boots on the ground. We hire them from the markets that, that we're in. So we hire locals to do that kind of stuff. They'll come out to your place. They meet you. They, they usually will go see the property with the landowners. They take photos. And then, you know, if the landowner wants to move forward, we build digital maps. So, you know, whether it's using Onyx Maps or HuntWise or another mapping company. And so we'll build property maps and no-go zones. And here's where you park. And here's where X, Y, and Z is. And then we'll also do in the onboarding process, yeah, how do you get to my place and arrival instruction? Basically, all the stuff that you tell people every single time they want to come out to your place, we do it once. Yeah. And then we send it over. So when you accept those bookings, all that that's sent over to the guest. Okay. So they could literally never speak to you and they, they would have a total lay of the land. Now, some landowners like that and some landowners love to meet everybody. It's all up to the landowner's preference, but we built it for the person who doesn't want to do any of that. So it's, I'll accept a booking. Here's how you get to my place. Here are the maps. Here are the rules. 
and basically back to work. Okay. Nick DeCastro, my guest today, he's founder and CEO of Land Trust. As we are talking about this, it's really a, an opportunity looking at trying to exploit and get make some use of some of your land from a recreational standpoint. We've talked about a lot of the different details of that. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk the financial side of things, Nick, okay? And we're going to get into how that works. And I know you've got that set up and how does how does the landowner get paid and, lo- and those kinds of situations, sure. how they set that up. We're going to get into that when we come back, folks. We'll get into it with some more when we come back here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Don't keep your cow-calf herd data in a notebook. Keep it in the cloud with Performance Ranch and say so long to decoding handwritten notes. Performance Ranch is an easy-to-use app that simplifies record-keeping and makes decision-making easier. Keep track of herd inventory, monitor health records, and manage costs all from your iPad or iPhone. Group texting important herd data? Delete it. Use Performance Ranch instead. Go to PerformanceLivestockAnalytics.com and be the first to know when Performance Ranch is ready to launch. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. My guest today is Nick DeCastro. He's the founder and CEO of Land Trust. And I invite you to go back and listen to uh, in the first segment of this as Nick did a great job of explaining what they are. And you can also go to their website at landtrust.com and you can find out more information as well. Nick, uh, we've talked about in the last segment some of the concerns that ranchers might have. Uh, we talked about how you vet some of the users and how that system works, some liability issues with that. And then how that, you know, how as a, as a landowner, what kind of interaction and the variable options that landowners can do when it comes to their interaction with the hunters. And of course, there's a lot of technology just even now than there was 10 years ago. You'd mentioned Onyx and I, that's the, I mean, shoot, we use that out here just to find corners on land or, or find where maybe right. a section marker should, should be. So that's a pretty uh, universal system there to, to use some of that technology that's there. So let's get into the financial side of this. Because one of the things, as you said, too, and I want to keep going back to this point is, you know, you you guys are really big on the fact landowner always has control. At the end of the day, landowner right. always has control on these guests and various things. So from a financial standpoint, how does this process work? Yeah, so uh, I like to preface this with saying that we are business partners with landowners. The landowner owns the asset, which is the land. And we go and build the technology, do the marketing, payment processing, kind of the stuff we're touching on here. But we're, we're business partners. We don't sell anything to landowners. We're probably one of the few people that ever, you know, quote, knock on your door uh, as a rancher or farmer that's not asking for some money or some control. <laughs> uh, we bring money and you, you stay in control. So, you know, from a financial perspective, everything is, is done through the platform. So when you get onboarded and we have a team of realized human beings that will we'll do all the heavy lifting for you. We'll get on a quick call, show you how it works. You know, you can run it basically from your phone. You'll get text messages and whatnot. It's pretty simple. But in that onboarding call, you connect your bank account to the platform. And so I want to be really clear here. This is not land trust technology. We're using a company called Stripe. Stripe is about a $50 billion company that facilitates payments for most of the internet. It's bank grade security. We don't see any of that stuff. We use them as a payments facilitator. So you connect your bank account to it. And then once you do that, you know, the, the guests, they pay with a credit card in full up front. When you accept a booking, we capture hundred percent of that. When the trip happens, we basically hold that money in escrow. So let's just say, mm-hmm. Justin, uh, you list on land trust, those turkeys that you told me about. And I say, Ooh, I want to go hunt turkeys down there. You say, Hey, we've got a, a three day package to do it yourself for spring turkeys. And we've got a bunk house you could sleep in for two nights and it's 1200 bucks for that package. I send you a request. You can talk to me via the phone or you can talk to me just over the platform and just message back and forth with each other. If you like me, you accept my request. At that point in time, Land Trust captures 100%, $1,200. We hold it in escrow until the trip happens. So this is also for trust, right? You don't want someone who pretends to be a landowner to offer something and scam people, right? So both sides. Exactly. So we hold it we hold that money in escrow until the trip. So on the last day of the trip, we initiate a direct deposit to your bank account. So money never changes hands between you and your guests. As we talked about in the last segment, you don't even ever need to meet your guests if you don't want to. Some people do, some people don't. So at the end of the year, automatically you'll get the form of like, hey, here's your income and earnings and and whatnot. So um, everything is, you never touch cash. You're not getting deposits or someone saying they'll write you a check or they'll give you cash when you show up. 
It's all happening through the platform. Mm-hmm. So do you assist as, as we're looking at that and say, I'm going in, I'm like, man, I just don't know what, you know, what should I be charging for a turkey hunt? I don't know. Or what should I be hunting or charging for hunting prairie dogs? Or I, I don't know. Right. I mean, do you guys have a basis that you can help facilitate some of that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is, again, being business partners, you guys owning the asset and us, it's our job to understand the market, understand the types of activities that are interesting to folks. And so we absolutely do help our landers say, if they don't have a, some landers come in, they say they know exactly what they want to charge, what they want to offer, and they're good to go. Some landers, like you're saying, it's like, well, what, I don't know, what, what do I have? <laughs> and so that's what our landowner success managers, their title, their job title is very descriptive, landowner success manager. So their whole job is to make landowners successful. Because remember, we don't make any money unless landowners do. So we're not selling you something and then trying to deliver. We are completely aligned with our landowners. So part of that would be looking at the resource and you know the market specifically and say and start to say, hey, here's what you could offer. Here's the whole menu of things you could offer. And you can choose what you do and don't want to. And if you have no idea what you want to charge, we can give some guidance. But at the end of the day, it's always your choice. You want to charge one dollar or a million dollars? That's up to you. Mm-hmm. Nick, I, I want to go back to one thing, and and you mentioned it when we sure. were talking about the vetting users, and I just I want to go through that again, and and, and because yes. I, I think for for a lot of when we talk with with a lot of ranchers, I don't know how many of us have really booked an Airbnb buying you know for sure. you know and and I yeah, but, but totally. at the same time we've probably ordered something on on Amazon or we've ordered something on a yep. different website and and we rely a lot quite a bit on those stars. So I just want to go back through that a little bit because I think that's, I think the concern of ranchers have is, man, I just don't want a knucklehead on my place. There's no guarantee you're not going to get a knucklehead by no means. But at the same time, that star rating is really, it's, it's where our, you know, in our, in our world of internet buying, that's kind of what is, is important. Yeah. And that's something the internet has done, like you said, across whether it's e-commerce, buying stuff from Amazon or other, or, you know, marketplaces like the ones we've mentioned. So ratings and reviews. So again, just to reiterate, nobody can use land trust who hasn't accepted our terms of service, which means they indemnify and hold harmless our landowners. So that's good. Um, they also can't ever make their an inquiry or a booking request without ID verification. So they, we use a, a platform that you take a picture of your driver's license or your passport, government ID, and then it takes a picture of them and it makes sure they're a real person. Um, so we know who they are. We're trying to get through their true identity. Again, versus someone knocking on your door that could be the best person in the world or maybe not, and you'd have no idea. So we're tying it to a real identity. They're paying with credit cards. So now we have their ID and their credit card. And then, of course, after every booking, that landowner who hosted that guest gets to rate them. Mm-hmm. So they can give them from one to five stars and then they can write as much as they want about that person. And so that next landowner down the line gets to go and say, oh, Nick, Nick has his ID verified. He's got his email verified. He's been on 27 trips and he's five star rated. Mm-hmm. So you can feel very comfortable yeah. um, with that. And then again, of course, you get to interact with me too. So I, I would make a request to you and say, hey, I'm really interested in coming out for turkeys in the spring. Mm-hmm. You can message back with me. We don't give any of your information out. They can't call you. They can't you know, email you outside of this. A lot of our landowners and, sport and, and guests do and, and talk on the phone. And landers can feel people out like that too. And they can say yes or no. For whatever reason, they could decline any request that comes through. Mm-hmm. All right. As we're kind of getting close to wrapping up here, Nick, I want to go back through some sure. things. You had already mentioned some of the different components that we could be putting out yeah, there as activities, land, activities yeah. as mm-hmm. landowners. I think sometimes uh, we, we might be a little bit limited in our, in our own thinking of say, well, this is this is all I think we have. I've got, you know, we can do mule deer on this play with a whitetail here, prairie dog. And yeah, I've right. got a bunch of turkeys. You just, you know, we talked about that a little bit ago. But th- there's other elements and just maybe list through some of those some of the things, because I've got a list just as as I went and did some research before our interview and then some things sure. that you've already hit already and maybe just go through that stuff again. Yeah, some of the activities that can be hosted. So, uh, again, hunting is where you spent a lot of time. And I will just stress to ranchers that, yes, if you have big deer, you have big elk or whatever, you know that that's, that's a valuable resource to have access to, of course. But there's a lot of bird hunters. There's a lot of people that want to go out and, you know, chase white-tailed does or uh, turkeys, as I mentioned. We did more turkey hunts on the platform than anything else last year. So 
don't just think, you know, if you're Montana elk is everyone's brain as an elk. Like, yeah, but there's a lot of other things too that people really enjoy getting out after. So hunting, fishing, of course. So whether it's, you know, you're on a river, stream, spring creek, pond, whatever, people are looking for those types of activities too. Bird watching is one that we're going to be developing more of. It's shocking. I didn't know this, but bird watching is a $40 billion with a B industry oh, wow. in the U S an annual $40 billion. So it's about twice as big as hunting. Um, and these are people who just want to get out there and I mean, they're kind of like hunters. They just look at, you know, birds through binoculars rather than over the barrel of a gun, <laughs> uh, foraging, whether it's mushroom hunting or whatever, you know, foraging is something we've had people book, uh, what do they call it? Looking for like arrowheads yeah. or things like yeah. that. We just had a really prominent kind of family here in the big timber, the Indulins. They're booking um, regenerative ranch tours. Mm -hmm. So they have a package. We have a, an activity called Farm and Ranch Activities, which you can kind of do anything. So it could be come out and watch this cat or brandings or, you know, whatever it might be. But um, the Indulins are hosting people to see how they run their regenerative ranching operation. So there's just a lot of opportunity. And then RVs, I think, yep. is going to be a big one. The RV industry exploded this last few years. And again, if you had the opportunity of someone who just bought or rented an RV to go to a KOA with 300 other people or to go out and park it on a beautiful farm or ranch, maybe with a pond, I think there's going to be a lot of market there for that as well. So in different areas of the country, there are going to be these different kinds of activities, like I mentioned earlier, as we get into Minnesota and some of these northern states. Um, snowmobiling is something yeah. that a lot of people have brought to us like, hey, we'd love to book this property and go snowmobile on. You know, something else I was thinking about, uh, even mountain biking probably too, huh, Nick? Totally. Yep, absolutely. And in, in the overlanding, I don't know if you've heard the term or your, mm -hmm. your audience has heard the term, but people like to build out, you know, vans or trucks and yeah. put all the tents and everything on it. But that's a big, big market. And you know, that's another thing. So mountain biking or overlanding, people coming out. Just camp and whatnot. Mm -hmm. All right, Nick. So we're just about done here, but you know, how do they get a hold of you? I know, I know on the website you can go to again, sure. it's landtrust.com. You can go to that website. And as yep. a rancher, you could go into that as a landowner. You can go in that and already start the process, get that field out there. But I know there's right. also, you know, as you were mentioning earlier, you know, give us a call. So how do they go about doing that to, to, if they're interested, A, in just finding out more information or B, looking at this? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we, look, we pride ourselves on serving our, our customers and our partners. So uh, we're extremely ser service oriented. We're not just some technology company where we expect you to go do it yourself. All of our landowners are working farmers and ranchers and are very busy people. So you can you can go to the website, landtrust.com. There's a landowner page. It gives a lot of the information we talked about. But we also just encourage you to give us a call or a text. So you can call us or text us. That number is going to be 406 709 eight four five zero and you know real live people here in bozeman will answer the phone talk to you answer any questions you have like i said we, we really pride ourselves on service if it is something you're interested in our team will do all the heavy lifting so we'll build your listing in a, into a draft we'll talk to you and we'll take all that information we'll, we'll do all the work and then you know get, do an onboarding call that's maybe 15 or 20 minutes with josh here who sits just a few feet from me right now and answer all your questions show you how it works you can run it from your phone so mm -hmm. basically, as a landowner who comes online uh, onto the platform, if you get an inquiry, we send you an email and a text message. Okay. And so it's, most, of our, most of our landowners are running this thing from their phone. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I'm, in, I'm intrigued with it all as well. I think sometimes it's, it's kind of a hidden, hidden element to our ranching operations, our land operations that we don't really think yep. about. And I think as landowners, I feel we take for granted some of the resources that we see every day that other people don't. I think that's capitalizing on that. That is one thing we have noticed overwhelmingly. We work with many multi-generation families and we go out and visit their place. And, oh my goodness, look at this place. <laughs> it's just every day to them. They've grown up there their entire life. They've been there a few generations. Yeah. They always, farmers and ranchers always underplay what they have. And it's, you know, it's because they've lived there their whole lives and it's normal to them. It's, it's something very special to a lot of people. And a lot of our lenders have taken a lot of joy in sharing what their property and their operation is with really respectful people. You bet. Well, Nick, I appreciate you joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. You bet. 
Nick DeCastro, founder and CEO of Land Trust, a very intriguing concept, no doubt. And I, I guess for me, it really stirs a lot of different thoughts because I, I, I have really pushed, if you've listened to our show much, you know that I, I really do push that we need to be looking at what we do here in ranching as a business aspect. And as Nick and I were talking off air, he had had a uh, landowner rancher uh, make this comment to him that really when it comes to what we do we're, we're in the land business and agriculture our cattle or maybe it's farming or sheep or different elements of agriculture are enterprises within that and what's to say that recreation can't be an enterprise also a part of that so I think for all of us you need to do your due diligence on it I, it's it's my job here I feel to, to, to bring this to you for something of consideration and so I, I do that here today and I think it's very intriguing with that now if you do want to get a hold of them again the website you can get more information there is landtrust.com and the phone number nick gave us 406-709-8450 you can give them a call and also help us out too be sure to let them know that i sent you there and you heard it here on the working ranch radio show well stay with us meteorologist don day joins us as we take a look at our long-term weather when we return on the working ranch radio show Cattle producers, here's a way to put more dollars in your pocket. Put the Amifirm advantage found in all Gain Smart Mineral to work in your cow herd. Amifirm is the industry leader in increasing fiber digestion. In fact, research shows putting Amifirm to work increases forage utilization by 10%, reducing overall forage costs and allowing you to graze more animals per acre. That's a big time return on your investment. To find which Gain Smart Mineral formula is right for your herd, visit gainsmart.com. And we welcome you back here to the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. As we turn our attention now and take a look at our long-term weather today, brought to you by Allflex. Cattle identification and record keeping should be easy, so tie your visual tags, your EID tag, and genetic data to one management number with Allflex matched sets. You can learn more about it at allflexusa.com. And joining us as he does each and every week to take a look at our long-term weather is meteorologist Don Day. And Don, uh, we've we've went through here this last week a pretty major snowstorm, winter storm that went through and kind of just slashed the country a bit. And we saw a lot of moisture. I, in fact, last week it was interesting. Uh, you had a really great graphic on your weather video podcast that showed the snow cover all the way from uh, the the California Nevada border all the way up into North Dakota and Canada. And really, we'd see a large large portion of snow cover. Now, you say we are definitely in a shift in our weather pattern and so as we look into this next week a lot of that snow is going to start coming and transforming into water yeah it is and with these warmer temperatures we are going to finally start the snow melt which usually by now is is on but it's been delayed because of the cold um and really from from the red river valley up along the you know the, the the river systems coming out of Canada into the eastern Dakotas and Minnesota. Uh, we're going to start to see some of that snowpack beginning to melt out and as well as into uh, part of the Plain States and Rockies uh, in those areas you just mentioned. Um, there's certainly going to be some concern, especially when we take a look, you know how I like to do a historical perspectives <laughs> yeah. on things. But the last time the snowpack in the inner mountain west has been this big, uh, this late, uh, it goes back into the 82, 83 winter. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of flooding um, as temperatures warmed up in April and May and into early June. Uh, and in places you don't necessarily associate with flooding, you know, places like Utah mm -hmm. uh, and some places where the uh, big snowpack melting very, very quickly can cause some problems. But we, you and I will be talking in the coming <laughs> weeks about flooding concerns yeah. in many areas. Yeah. Well, and I know it's something I had been asking you the last couple of months at different occasions, different inter intervals about that potential as we kept continuing to talk about more and more snowpack in, in the western parts of the country that feed these rivers that go through the rest of the country. Now, with this shift, uh, with the weather shift that we're seeing, 
You talked about uh, that maybe potentially we might start to see the, those drought areas of Kansas and Oklahoma, northern and, and, and Texas and some of those places, maybe see some uh, some moisture. In addition to that, maybe a reprieve as well with some of the severe weather that we've seen through the southeast. Yeah, with it warming up across the northern plains and throughout the far western areas of the United States, that big contrast between these cold systems coming out of the Rockies and Plains, hitting the Midwest and the Gulf Coast with that warm, moist air is, well, with this pattern change here for the next seven to 10 days or so, we're not going to have that big contrast. So this is going to ease up the amount of severe weather that's produced all the tornado activity over the last few weeks. So the mechanism, mechanisms responsible for that severe weather are shifting. Now, we are going to see some active weather here this weekend uh, along the Gulf Coast. Uh, from Far East Texas, along the Gulf Coast, through Louisiana, Southern Mississippi, Alabama, and into Florida. Florida is dry. Florida is very dry. Uh, they're going to see some beneficial rain. There might be a little bit of severe weather down there, but this pattern change is going to start allowing storm systems to maybe take a different path from the West Coast now into the midsection of the country. And we're, what we're hoping is a more southerly path with some of these storms is what, what we're seeing. Could open the door to more moist air coming up and getting into West Texas, getting into Kansas and Oklahoma with some areas of rain and thunderstorm activity. This is something that we see in about a week or so. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe going on after that. So with this pattern change, fingers and toes crossed, some of those most severe drought areas, especially winter wheat country, maybe we've got some better chances of rain coming. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the, the weather that we've had is it's been diagonal from, from the southeast, or excuse me, southwestern part of the country up into the northeast and kind of over the Great Lakes area. That's been kind of our weather pattern for a, about a month or so, or maybe longer than that. As we see this shift, what about our Corn Belt area? What about like into Iowa and Illinois and, and some of those northern Corn Belt regions? Uh, what are they see, What are they going to see when this weather pattern shifts? is in, in the process of shifting? Well, certainly with this warmer temperature and 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 better weather conditions, I think you are going to see some um, folks out in the fields. And I, I, I do see that there are some pockets of the Corn Belt that need some, some rain. Uh, there's really poor soil moisture across some of the key corn areas of Nebraska going into northwest Iowa. But as you get into the central and eastern Corn Belt, I think what's setting up is a good start to their season uh, in terms of what's coming with soil moisture and a pattern that should be conductive to um, the right amounts of spring precipitation. You know, you kind of want that, mm -hmm. you know, you want it, but you don't want too much. And I yeah. think that's kind of where they're headed. All right, Don, thanks for joining us again. Thanks, Justin. And again, that is meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. If you want to follow along with him daily, you can go to his website at dayweather.com as he kicks out a, a daily video podcast every Monday through Friday morning and also occasionally on the weekends when there's a big weather events taking place like we saw last week. Our weather today brought to you by Allflex. Cattle identification and record keeping should be easy. So you can tie your visual tags, your EID tags and the genetic data all to one management number with all flex matched sets you can learn more at allflexusa.com well stay with us coming up in our last segment i'll tell you what's in store for next week's show when we return on the working ranch radio show Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. Coming up on next week's edition of the Working Ranch Radio Show, we're going to find out about the history and the heritage of the cattle industry in the great state of Iowa and what it means to today's beef industry. They're one of the top 10 nationally for cow-calf production and top four for cattle on feed. We're going to find out all about it next week as we learn more about the Iowa cattle industry. Well, the Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's Ranchers. If you'd like to get a hold of me, 
me. My email address is justin.workingranch at gmail.com. If you like the show, let us know in the comments or drop me a line as well. Be sure to join us right here at this same time, same place next week. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Justin Mills. And until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long. Oh,